part of the chapter that I wanted to focus on was there in just verse 2, where the Bible reads, Beware of dogs. And that's the title of my sermon tonight, is Beware of Dogs. And it's going to be a little interesting uh, sermon, and it's going to be a little bit different. The uh, concept that I want to do today is I want to do a study on the word dog in the Bible. Because if he's saying for us to beware of dogs, what does that mean? Well, I think the only way to really get a good idea of what that means is to look at every time dogs mentioned in the Bible. And it's mentioned in 40 different verses 41 times. So one verse, it mentions it twice. But there's 40 different verses. We're going to look at all of them. Go to Exodus chapter 22, if you would. Now, I'm going to prove to you tonight that dogs, what they really represent is the really wicked and ungodly and just the unsaved heathen. Right, it's right. super clear what the Bible says. There's no positive mention of a dog in the Bible. Right. And God gives us a lot of earthly examples. He gives us a lot of things that we can understand really well to give light to spiritual truths, to give light to the things of God. That's how God reveals a lot of different things to us. Look at verse 31 of Exodus chapter 22. It says, And ye shall be holy men unto me, neither shall ye eat any flesh that is torn of beasts in the field. Ye shall cast it to the dogs. And I have six attributes that I think the Bible kind of outlines, outlines for us about dogs. The first one is that they're unclean. These are just unclean animals. And if you go to Leviticus chapter 11, go back in your, or go forward in your by one chapter to Leviticus chapter 11, we're going to see the Bible tells us there's a difference between clean beasts and unclean beasts. Now, the children of Israel back in that time, they weren't allowed to eat an unclean beast. So let's look at verse 3 in Leviticus 11. It says, Whatsoever parteth the hoof and is cloven footed and cheweth the cud among the beasts, that shall ye eat. So it's going to outline a lot of things that we shouldn't. This is the only part where it says this is what you can eat. It says if it's you know parted in the hoof, it's, it's cloven footed, I meaning it's like two. I meaning it just has like two little parts. It's not really like a paw, but if you've seen like a, a goat or you've seen a lamb or you've seen a deer, these are the animals that have this type of a hoof. And it says that they chew the cud. Cud's kind of an interesting word. It just means that when they're eating straw or grass or hay, that they regurgitate that food. So it like goes down into their stomach, and then later it comes back up again, and they chew on it more. And then it goes back down like a cow. It has four different parts to its stomach. So it eats its food over and over and over. I read uh, on an article today, it said that a cow will chew its food for eight hours a day. I mean, it said the main purpose, the cow goes out and he just like stuffs himself, and then he goes and finds a safe place, and he just sits there and just gnaws on that food. And he chews the cud. And that's what Baptists, fundamental Baptists need to be today. We need to chew the cud, meaning we need to just soak in the fundamentals of the faith. Amen. Just salvation by faith. That Jesus Christ is God. The Trinity. The King James Bible. All these fundamentals of the faith. We need to eat them so much. Just regurgitate them so much that we can go out and teach them. We're not just hearers of the word, but we're doers of the word. Amen. That we move on from just, oh, I've heard that before. To, oh, I know that. Oh, I have that memorized. Oh, I can go out there and teach that. I can show all these, these fundamental things because I've been regurgitating it. I've been meditating on it. That's what it means to be fundamental. It's the fact that you know the fundamentals of the faith. What a shame today. There's so many fundamental Baptists today. If you go talk to the person in the pew, they can't, they can't explain any of the doctrines to you. They could maybe just say, yeah, we believe in God and Jesus and the Bible. But if he's like, can you show me some verses on that? They would really struggle. That's a shame because they're not chewing the cut. And we see that's what's a clean beast. But look, let's look at a few other verses. Let's keep going. Look at verse 4. Nevertheless, he shall ye not eat of them that chew the cud, or of them that divide the hoof as the camel, because he cheweth not the cud, but divideth not the hoof. He is unclean unto you. So that's kind of the only animal that, you know, is kind of an exception because he doesn't chew the cud. Look at this, verse 5. And the coney, because he cheweth not the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean unto you. Look at verse 6. And the hair, because he chewed the cud, but divideth not the hoof, he is unclean to you. That's talking about someone, maybe they're meditating the Bible, but they're still in the Word. They're still in the world. They're still out of the world. They haven't divided themselves. They haven't separated themselves from the world. They want to still live in the world. You can't have it both ways. Right. And we see that if you're in the world, even if you're, regurg you're like regurgitating the Word of God, you're studying it, you're going to be unclean according to God. Let's skip down to uh, verse 26. Interesting uh, part here. It says, The carcasses of every beast which divideth the hoof, and is not cloven-footed, nor cheweth the cud, are unclean unto you. 
Everyone that toucheth them shall be unclean. Look at verse 27. And whatsoever goeth upon his paws among all manner of beasts that go on all four, these are unclean unto you. Whoso toucheth their carcass shall be unclean until the evening. So if you know a dog, I think everybody knows that dogs have paws, that they go on all fours. The Bible says it's an unclean beast. And it never changes this fact. It's always clear. This is just a dirty animal. And the verse that I had you read, it said, when they had this abominable flesh, they would just cast into the dogs, and the dogs would eat it. I mean, what will a dog not eat? I mean, my dog will eat just about anything. I mean, it, you can just throw it on the ground, and it'll try to eat it. About the only thing it doesn't try to eat is usually like vegetables, something that's kind of like healthy, you know? But I mean, they'll just eat anything. And that's what the world is like today. They have no restrictions. They have no morals. They have no guiding compass. They'll go and do and say anything. That's right. They'll, they'll compromise themselves in any way. They'll fill themselves with any kind of abominable flesh. They don't care. They turn on the TV. They'll go listen to any kind of music. They'll go to the movie house. They'll watch it all. There's no filter. There's no guide. Why? Because they're likened them to a dog. Those that are unsaved, they have no restrictions. They have no guiding you know, morals that can be founded on anything that's in the Bible, typically. Go to uh, 1 Kings chapter 14. 1 Kings chapter 14. We'll look at another mention of the dogs. I'll read for you from 2 Corinthians 6. The Bible says, Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So you say, well, we're looking at a lot of Old Testament passages where it's talking about unclean beasts. How does that apply to me today? Well, in the New Testament, he's applying it to a spiritual or to the fact that you shouldn't hang out with unbelievers. You should be out of the world. That you shouldn't have your closest friend be an unbeliever. You shouldn't have some guy that he doesn't, he doesn't believe on Jesus Christ, maybe even hates Jesus Christ. That's not your friend. That's not the person that you should be hanging out with all the time. You should be calling him and bringing him over and doing the barbecue. No. The Bible says not to touch the unclean thing. Now, making this clear, this isn't saying like you can't touch a literal dog. I'll be honest, I have a dog. I pretty much always had a dog. I'm not trying to say that it's a sin to have a dog or that it's bad to have a dog. No, but the Bible's using the dog as an illustration to show us something spiritual, that this is a dirty, unclean beast. We shouldn't have those type of people in our life as our best friend. What is the dog known for in the world? Man's best friend, right? right? But that's not, that's the opposite of what the Bible's telling us. That shouldn't be our best friend. Amen. The unclean beast right. should not be our friend. Now, of course, we should love them. You know, the unsaved people, we should want to get them saved. And we should be friendly unto them. But that doesn't mean they're going to be our closest pal. They're going to be teaching us things. We're going to be sharing our lives together. Now, if you just go ahead and preach them the gospel all the time, either they're going to get saved or they're not going to want to be your friend. Right. Right. So that's the best thing to do. Look at 1 Kings 14 where I had you turn. Look at verse 11. Him that dieth of Jeroboam in the city shall the dogs eat. And him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat, for the Lord hath spoken it. Look two chapters over. Chapter 16, look at verse 4. Him that dieth of Baasha in the city shall the dogs eat. And him that defieth of his in the fields shall the fowls of the air eat. Go to chapter 21. We're going to see another similar statement there. Chapter number 21. Look at verse 19. The Bible says, And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Hast thou killed, and also taken possession? And thou shalt speak unto him, saying, Thus saith the Lord, In the place where the dogs licked the blood of Naboth, shall dogs lick thy blood, even thine. So I see these dogs are just eating these people. They're eating blood. Again, just confirming the fact they're just... They have no filter. They have no sensor. They're just going to eat all kinds of wicked and filthy things. We're not supposed to. We're commanded in the Old Testament not to even drink blood or consume blood. That's not a. That's not a healthy thing for us. That's a. That's a sin. But you know, this is like the wicked. They like to lie and wait for blood. Go to uh, Proverbs chapter one, if you would. I'm going to read for you a couple verses in Psalms 55. The Bible says at verse 23, "But thou, O God, shalt bring them down into the pit of destruction." 
Bloody and deceitful men shall not live out half their days, but I will trust in thee. Psalms 59 2 says, Deliver me from the workers of iniquity. Save me from bloody men. Look at verse 11 there in Proverbs 1. If they say, Come with us, let us lay wait for blood. Let us lurk privily for the innocent without cause. Go to uh, Proverbs chapter 12. This is what the unsaved is like. They lie in wait for blood just like the dogs. They're going to feast on that blood. They're going to feast on the flesh of those that are weak or injured. They don't really care. The unheathen is just looking out for himself. And that's the best way to describe a dog. A dog doesn't really care about anybody but himself. He just wants to go out and he's just going to satisfy all the lusts of the dog's flesh. You know, whatever that is. He's just looking for the next meal. I mean, I sometimes wonder if I just got a bowl of food that was just like endless, if my dog would ever stop eating. I don't think it would. I, mean, I think most dogs just sit there and eat and eat and eat and just consume. And that's what the unsaved are like. They're just trying to gratify their flesh to the fullest. They're just going to keep gratifying and gratifying. It's never satisfying to them. Right. They're just going to keep filling it. And we see that they're also filling it with blood. They're filling it with eating the flesh. Look at Proverbs 12, verse 6. The words of the wicked are to lie in wait for blood. But the mouth of the upright shall deliver. So just as we see the dogs going to lick the blood, who are the people you know going for blood in the Bible? The wicked, ungodly, saved people. It's the same parallel with the with the dogs. Go to First Kings chapter twenty-one. Go back if you would. We're going to see a few more verses where it says the exact same thing. And it might be a little laborious tonight, but I want to look at every mention of the word dog because I think it's going to really help solidify in our mind what the Bible's saying when it says, "Beware of dogs." Look at 1, Corinthians, or 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 23. And of Jezebel also spake the Lord, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the wall of Jezreel. Look at verse 24. Him that dieth of Ahab in the city, the dogs shall eat. And him that dieth in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. Now it's talking about their dead carcass. So it's not saying like they're going to be viciously attacking them in these verses. It's just saying they're going to eat disgusting, vile. I mean, dogs will eat the most disgusting things on the planet. I used to have a cat. Luckily it died because I don't really like cats very much. I'll be honest with you. But my cat, we had a litter box, and my dog just couldn't wait to get in that litter box and to eat everything that my cat dropped down in that cat litter box. I mean, that's just disgusting. That is filthy. He'll eat, the dog will eat feces. It eats its own vomit. It'll eat other people's vomit. I mean, it's an unclean beast. It's just super clear. And that's what the world's like. Yeah. Don't be deceived. The unbeliever, the unsaved, he's going to eat the most wicked, vile things, spiritually speaking. I mean, he can consume anything. Don't take it pat. Don't think, well, this guy's a really nice guy, even though he's not saved. No, he'll eat the most disgusting things when you're not looking. Go to uh, chapter 22. Just go one chapter forward. So we're looking at a lot of verses that say the exact same thing. We'll look at a few more that say basically the same thing. 1 Kings 22, verse 38. And one washed the chariot in the pool of Samaria, and the dogs licked up his blood, and they washed his armor according unto the word of the Lord, which he spake. Go to 2 Kings chapter 9. 2 Kings, go just another book in the Bible. 2 Kings chapter 9. Look at verse 10. It's just going to keep you know, hammering on these, these wicked people that these dogs are eating. It says in verse 10, And the dogs shall eat Jezebel on the portion of Jezreel, and there shall be none to bury her. And he opened the door and fled. Go to verse 36. Skip down to verse 36. Wherefore they came again and told him, and he said, This is the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servant Elijah the Tishbite, saying, In the portion of Jezreel shall dogs eat the flesh of Jezebel. And go to Psalm 68. This will be the last verse for this point. Psalm 68. So we see a lot of verses. Just saying the same thing over and over and over. But it's a giving us a real clear picture of what these dogs are like, right? They eat really disgusting, vile things. They're not a clean beast. Look at Psalm 68, verse 23. The Bible says, That thy foot may be dipped in the blood of thine enemies, and the tongue of thy dogs in the same. So again, they're just, they love to drink blood. They love to eat anything disgusting and vile. So go back in your Bible. Let's go back to Judges chapter 7. So my first point is that the dog's super clear is an unclean beast. So we've looked at several verses already. My second point is that dogs are unprofitable. Unprofitable. Go to Judges 7, look at verse 4. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down into the water, and I will try them for, the, for thee there. And it shall be 
that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee, and of whosoever I say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go with thee. Look at verse 5. So he brought down the people into the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue, as the dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink. And the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were three hundred men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By three hundred men that lapped will I save you, and deliver the Midianites into the hand, and let all the other people go, every man into his place. So now this is kind of a, a, a mystery. I think it's kind of a harder passage. You're like, why in the world is God asking these guys to do these things? You know, these, he's, he's trying to separate the forces, and they have like a great multitude that's going to go fight this battle, and he's trying to wield them down. And he finally gets to, he's like, let's just get the guys that lap up some water like a dog. And it gets down to 300. And I think the key to understanding this verse is the context and verse 7. Look at where it says in the middle, it says, By the 300 men that lapped will I save you. Now the whole point of what God was trying to do was just trying to prove, I'm the one that saves you. I'm the one that's going to give you the deliverance. It's not by this great host, because they were going to fight, you know, like millions of people. They were going to go fight this battle. He's like, look, by the guys that drink water like a dog, I'm going to save you. Just 300 of these guys that lap water like a dog, because a dog's just worthless. A dog's just unprofitable. He has no real value, and these guys are like, drinking water like a dog, I'm going to save you. So I think that's what he's trying to say. He's just trying to show, look, you know, these guys that are drinking water like a dog, these are the guys going to save you. You look at them and you're kind of like, I'm going to get saved by these guys? I mean, they just look like animals. You, 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 can, you can picture some guys, maybe they're not the strongest ones, they're not the most valiant. These guys are drinking water like a dog. You're kind of like, really? Those are the 300 guys that didn't go out with battle? But God's like, look, I'm the one that's going to deliver you. I'm the one that's going to save you. It's not by our might. It's by God's power. And we see that there was at least 300 men standing. I think that's another application you could take in this passage. There was 300 guys that standing. All the other guys bowed down to drink the water. Right. But there was 300 guys. Left. With 300 guys, he defeated millions. And that's just to show God can do a big work with just a small group of people. Right. If they stand, if they're going to follow God. And guess what? These guys weren't doing it because they were strong, because they were mighty. Because they trusted in God. That's the key. That's the key. Go to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 24. You know, and, I mean, there's, a, there's one application we're going to get here that I think a dog has some value. But for the most part, they're just an unprofitable beast. They're just an unprofitable animal. And the Bible likens them as to being one of those just most worthless beasts on the, on the field. Right. 1 Samuel 24, look at verse 14. After whom is the king of Israel come out? After whom dost thou pursue? After a dead dog? After a flea? He's trying to say, after a dead dog, saying, like, this is just the most worthless thing. I mean, a dead dog? I mean, this is just nothing. This is just so unprofitable. There's nothing to, to benefit from this. Look at 2 Samuel. Go to 2 Samuel, if you would. 2 Samuel chapter 9. Again, we're looking at every single time the Bible talks about a dog. So in the Bible, we, when we read in Leviticus 11, it said that if you touch the carcass of the animal that had a paw, you were unclean. <coughs> so it's like, you know, this thing is just, it's so worthless, and nobody wants to touch it. It's just so disgusting. There's, it's unclean. There's nothing you want to do with it. It's going to say the same thing in 2 Samuel 9, verse 8. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that thou shouldest look upon such a dead dog as I am? Go to 2 Samuel chapter 16. Go a couple chapters forward. 2 Samuel 16. We're going to see the same phrase repeated a few times here. 2 Samuel 16, verse 9, Then said Abishai, the son of Zariah, unto the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Let me go over, I pray thee, and take off his head. So again, it's just, it's just kind of a, a negative slang term. He's just saying a dead dog is just worthless. There's no value. I mean, they're just completely unprofitable. Go to Job chapter 30. All right. Job chapter 30. We're going to see the exact same thing here in Job as well. And we even have Job talking. I'll give you a little bit of the context. It's Job talking in this chapter. And we'll just look at verse 1. It says, But now they that are younger than I have me in derision, whose fathers I would have disdained to have set with the dogs of my flock. He's saying, look, these guys that are younger than me, that, I, that have me in derision, I think they're so of unimportant value I wouldn't even want to set him with the dogs of my flock. And he's just saying, like, the dogs are just, you know, 
hardly worth anything. They're just so unvaluable. I mean, I wouldn't even want to set these guys that are least esteemed with my dogs in the flock. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 9. So we're seeing the Bible saying, look, these, guys, these beasts are unclean. There's pretty much no value. There's no point to these beasts. And the Bible says that without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Meaning what? Meaning the unsaved. We're supposed to repent from dead works. And we see there's no profitableness in an unsaved person. And the person that goes down and gives all their money to the poor and tries to live a really good life, it's of no value to God. Because without faith, it's impossible to please Him. And the, the, the works that the dog does is just kind of worthless. I mean, they look at it as like, this is the most worthless beast. It's so unprofitable. Ecclesiastes 9, look at verse 4. For to him that is joined to all the living, there is hope. For a living dog is better than a dead lion. You see, that sounds kind of positive. But he's saying, no, nope, not really. Because he's saying, look, a living dog is better than a dead lion. I mean, what? Even the most worthless beast, if it was alive, was better than someone's dead. He's just contrasting the fact that once you're dead, it's over. You're not going to get any more rewards in heaven after you die. It's over. I mean, so you need to spend your whole life. You say, how many rewards do I want? Well, you better get them all done while you're alive, because once you're dead, it's over. And he's saying, even a dead dog, I mean, at least, or I mean, a, even a living dog, I mean, the dog could get saved. I mean, the dog could still do good things. I mean, the dog has an opportunity to do something, and it's better than the person that's died. Maybe somebody that's courageous or strong, or somebody that has a lot of uh, wisdom after the flesh. It's better to have that living dog because he's at least alive. That's the whole point of that. But it's saying it's using the beast that's least esteemed. Is that, it's pretty clear. He's not trying to use a really great beast. He's using something of, of no value, basically. Go to Isaiah 66, if you would. Isaiah 66. So we see the, the dog really doesn't have much value. I mean, it's better if you're alive, at least, than dead. But the contrast there is between a lion and a dog. Lion being one of the strongest beasts of the, of, of the, of the Bible. Something that's very powerful. Something of great strength and value. Isaiah 66, look at verse 3. He that killeth an ox is as if he slew a man. He that sacrificeth a lamb as if he cut off a dog's neck. He that offereth an oblation as if he offered swine's blood. He that burneth incense as if he blessed an idol. Yea, they have chosen their own ways, and their soul delighteth in their abominations. So he sees contrasting good things with bad things. Like the guy that was going to offer a sacrifice to the ox, God looks at that because they were so disobedient as they're killing people. And he's saying, look, you're not offering the lamb, it's like offering a dog's neck. Because he's, he's contrasting a lamb with a, with a dog. Just keep your, well, don't keep your finger, just go to Exodus chapter thir 13. Exodus chapter 13. We're going to see something interesting. He said, cut off a dog's neck. What is that talking about? Well, the Bible makes it clear that there was a command of, in the Bible for them to make a sacrifice for the firstborn. So whenever they were coming into the new land, all the firstborn males were supposed to be given unto God, and they were supposed to make a sacrifice for them. And if we see in Exodus 13, verse 13, the Bible says, And every firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb. And if thou wilt not redeem it, then thou shalt break his neck, and all the firstborn of man among thy children shalt thou redeem. So the lamb, they were supposed to break the neck of the lamb as a sacrifice to redeem all the males in, in, the, in the Old Testament. And we see that he was contrasting the lamb with the dog being the most vile, wicked, anti, you know, uh, antithesis of a lamb. Basically the fact that the lamb represents Jesus Christ. It, it represents everything that's holy and right and spotless and perfect. What does the dog represent? If that's what the lamb's representing, it's the wicked, the ungodly, the unsaved, those that hate Jesus. I mean, it's something very bad. Go to Luke chapter 16. This will be the last uh, verse that we look at for this point. But it's pretty clear that the dog's just an unprofitable beast. There's nothing good. It's unclean. It's, it's pretty much worthless. It's not going to take the place of the lamb in the sacrifice. Luke 16, verse 20, the Bible says, And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. So he's saying, well, how does this mean that the dog's invaluable or, or not profitable? Well, I used to have a, I have a dog that used to have a problem. She had this paw, this right paw, and it had a little bit of an open wound. And you know what happens is they start licking it because they think that that'll help. But you know what happens with that wound? It just gets bigger. And then they keep licking it more. 
And then it gets even bigger. And soon enough, I mean, the dog is just sitting there licking its paw just forever. And you know, licking sores doesn't make it better. It makes it worse. And you know what these dogs do? They go to all these homeless beggars on the street and they lick their sores by giving them five bucks so they can get another drink. And it makes them worse. It makes them, it's horrible. Right. And that's not profiting anybody anything. That's unprofitable. And that's what all these people do. They're like these dogs just coming licking the sores of these beggars and making our society worse and worse and worse to the point that they become so dependent on the need of that that they can't do anything else. We see the dog that get the sore so bad, so much of an itch, so much of a dependence, it just has to keep licking it and licking it and licking it. And that's what happens to these homeless beggars and these derelicts in the gutter. We don't need the ungodly, but that's what the ungodly thinks they need. They all just come lick the sores. I'll just come, I'm doing such a good thing for this guy. I'm just going to help him out. I'm going to give him a couple bucks. But we see he's actually making it worse. And that's what the government does. It steals money from all of us, and it gives it to the lazy and the people that don't want to work, and it just keeps making things worse. Why? Because the unsaved can't profit anything of anybody. You say, well, they give money to the poor. No, they're doing it wrong, and they're making things worse. None of their works are good. They're dead works. Only We can, we can only do love through Jesus Christ. Don't get confused today. Beware of dogs. You say, this unsaved guy, he's so nice and he's so good. He's doing all these good things. He's not doing anything good. He's not helping anybody. It's unprofitable. The Bible makes this super clear. Go to Matthew chapter 6 if you would. You know, my dog, basically you have to put the dog in a cone or something. <laughs> you got to just kind of like restrict it. you got to just tell this thing no. Because it's going to do it whether or not you want it to or not. The Bible says, I'll read for you in a place. It says in Matthew 25, 30. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's interesting that Christ relates the unsaved person to the unprofitable servant. How much did this guy profit? Zero. And that's how much the profit of the unsaved person has. Matthew 6, verse 3, it says, But when thou doest alms, let not thy left hand know what the right hand doeth, that thine alms may be in secret, and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. We see the unsaved, they don't like to do this. They like to do it before men. And they have their reward on this earth. But guess what? It's not profiting anybody anything. So we see that the, these dogs, they're unclean. They're unprofitable. And we can take from the cardinal example of a dog, we can learn spiritual lessons, spiritual application to our lives and how we're supposed to live in this life. The, the, the point of the sermon is beware of dogs. We should beware of these things. Go to 2 Samuel 3. We'll look at my third point. The third point, I think, is just super obvious. Dogs are unwise. I mean, dogs are just stupid. I mean, they'll do all kinds of just foolish things. You can basically trick a dog into anything if you have, you know, some food or whatever. I mean, they have all these TV shows. Back when I used to watch a lot of TV, you know, the bad guys would come, and there's this vicious dog. What do they do? They just throw a piece of meat, and the dog runs away. Because he's just unwise. He's just foolish. He's stupid. 2 Samuel, verse 3. Look at verse 8. Then was Abner very wroth for the words of Ibosheth, and said, Am I a dog's head, which against Judah do show kindness this day unto the house of Saul thy father, to his brethren and to his friends, and have not delivered thee into the hand of David, that thou chargest me today with a fault concerning this woman? Now Abner was a great warrior, and he had taken one of Saul's concubines and lined with her. And now the, the king Ibosheth, of the, uh, of where the king was still kind of divided, it was David and Ibosheth, who was of Saul. It was Saul's house and David's house. They were kind of, you know, fighting for the kingdom when it was in this middle ground. And Ibosheth, you know, brings up this accusation against Abner, and he's like, you know, you're, you're lying with this, this uh, concubine of Saul. That's not right. And he says, am I a dog's head? And he said, what does that mean? Like, I, I was kind of pondering this, and I was like, what does that mean? It's just saying it's like the mind of a dog. He's just trying to say, am I an idiot? Because dog's head's stupid. A dog's head is foolish. He's like, am I a dog's head? Because he's saying, which against Judah do show kindness to stay in the house of God. He's saying, look, I'm against Judah. And we know Judah's like God's anointed city. I mean, he's blessing us. I'm fighting against them for you. And I'm doing all this work. And then you're just going to come and bring accusations against me and bring faults against me. He's like, I must just be stupid if I'm doing all this work for you. And then you're just going to come and accuse me and find fault with me. So we see the dog here is representing someone that's stupid. Someone that's just a fool. Go to uh, 
Proverbs chapter 26. Proverbs 26. <laughs> the Bible makes it clear that a dog's unwise. A dog's stupid. And that's the same way the unsaved are. They're foolish. They don't understand anything. The Bible says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. It says it's the beginning of understanding. It's the beginning of knowledge. If you don't have the fear of God, if you don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're just completely unwise. The Bible says you have no wisdom in you. Proverbs 26, verse 11, it says, As the dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. The unsaved, they also can't get the sin out of their life. I mean, right. they just keep returning to their own vomit, even though maybe they don't even want to. I don't know. Maybe the dog doesn't even like eating his vomit. He just does it. I don't, I don't know what goes through the mind of a dog. He's just kind of a slave to it. And that's what, pe that's what unsaved people are like. That's right. They're just a slave to their sin. They're just a slave to just go and commit all of this sin. And the Bible says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And I was thinking about this day when I was driving about how if you put borders on yourself, if you self-discipline yourself, that's when you have freedom. That's when you have liberty over your sin. If you don't put any borders or any gates over your heart, over your family, you're going to be a slave to the sins and all the, the things of this world, the temptations. They're going to take you and you're going to do the things you don't want. Right. You're going to say, I don't want to commit this sin. But if you don't put a gate, you don't put a border, you're going to go and do it anyways. Yep. And what does a slave do? Does a slave do what he wants? Or does he do what he doesn't want? It's what he doesn't want. That's what it means when you don't have any kind of self-discipline. If you don't have any rules for yourself, if you're not governing yourself, you're going to do that which you don't want to do. That's what Paul is saying. Look, he does what he doesn't want to do. But what does it freedom mean? Freedom means you do what you want. Right. And God said to give you the desires of your heart. When you protect yourself against the things you don't want, then it enables you to do the things you do want to do. That's what makes you free. That's what gives you freedom. It's not the absence of walls. It's not the absence of restrictions. It's not the absence of you know putting rules or, or uh, guidelines. No, those are to protect you from the things you don't want to do so you can do the things you do want to do. That's where freedom comes. And if you take the Bible, you take the laws of God, and you apply them to your life, you make those principles, that's how you can have freedom. But see, the unsaved, they don't have any of that. So they just return back to their own vomit. Go to Isaiah 56. You see, the dog is unwise. Isaiah 56, look at verse 10. His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. Sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Now, I'll say this. I don't believe the Bible has a positive mention of dogs in it. But from this verse, you could abstract an indirect positive mention. Because I would say that probably the, the one thing a dog really has value for is the fact that it can alert you. It can kind of warn you of things. And the Bible is saying here, it was using in the negative saying that these false prophets, these false teachers, they're like dumb dogs that don't warn you when there's trouble. They're not warning you about God's wrath. And so you're just, the, the enemy's coming, just pillaging and taking and stealing and killing and destroying because there's nobody warning you. There's nobody warning you from your sins. You know, I don't think it's a sin to have a real dog. And I think the, the, the main reason I have one, or the one I would have one, is just, hey, it can alert me. I mean, my dog, the best thing it's going to do is lick an intruder to death. I mean, it's not going to, it's not ferocious. It's not going to tear its head off. It's like, I mean, it's just going to be its best friend if he pets it, you know. I mean, but whenever the door gets knocked or something, usually it'll bark, it'll kind of startle, give the warning. I think that's a lot of representative of a pastor. A pastor's not going to follow you around all day. He's not going to help get the sin out of your life physically. He's not going to be like, don't look at that. Oh, don't touch that. No, but when he's preaching, when he's sounding the warning, he lets you get the alert so you can correct the issue. So you can take, you can, you can figure out what you need to do. That's good. Go to, uh, look at the next verse. So that's, that's my third point is that they're unwise. Let's look at another point, another attribute of dogs. Look at verse 11. Yea, they are greedy dogs which can never have enough. And they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, every one for his gain from his quarter. So you see, dogs, they're just greedy. Kind of goes back to the point that I was saying how the dog just looked out for himself. But I see, I think the, the point here is that dogs are unsatisfied. So they're unclean, they're unprofitable, they're unwise. They're just never satisfied. I mean, a dog will continue to eat and eat and eat and eat and then get, take more food. And then he's ready for the next meal. I mean, he won't ever be satisfied with anything. It's a lot like Romans 1 when it talks about the reprobate being implacable. 
being what they can't be placated, they can't be satisfied, they can't be appeased. I mean, I could pet my dog for an hour and it still want to be petted. I mean, the dog doesn't want it. It's just, look, it's just living on the next thrill, the next thrill, the next thrill. I mean, it's just got a short-term memory. All I can think about is the next thrill. All I can think about is the next thing is going to satisfy the flesh. That's what the unsaved's like. That's what the, uns that's what the unsaved's doing. They're never satisfied with anything that they do. They just want to keep going for more and more. They're just greedy. Go to uh, Exodus chapter 11. So we see that they're unclean. We see they're unprofitable. We see they're unwise. They're unsatisfied. Dogs are also unsafe. Now, today in America, we kind of have a warped opinion of what a dog is. But throughout history, when we think of dog, it's not, it's not really what history was like with dogs. I mean, only in the last few hundred years have we seen this just multiplicity of all these breeds of dogs that are even more unprofitable. Like the Chihuahua. I mean, that thing is so unprofitable. I mean, right. what is that thing worth for? I mean, if it just was out in the wild, it would definitely die. <laughs> that dog's just completely unprofitable. Yeah. If you have one and you love it, great. But, I mean, my dog's, you know, not really vicious. He's not going to protect himself either. I have a Welsh Corgi. But you see, go to Exodus chapter 11. I mean, that thing's just like a trophy or, you know, just like a, a doll or something. You just think it's pretty and you like to pet it and whatever. But it's not profitable. It doesn't have anything. But dogs, for the most part, throughout history, have been very unsafe. They've been a very dangerous animal. Look at Exodus 11, verse 7. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast, that ye may know how the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. So he's saying, look, these dogs, they're not even going to move their tongue. What does that mean? You know, the dog's kind of like, you know, or it's, got, it's foaming at the mouth. Sometimes my dog, you know, when the, the toddler or the baby comes near to like, we just have to smack that dog. He's like, no, you're not going to move your tongue against my child. And that's how God feels about, you know, his children. He doesn't want the dogs moving their tongue and, you know, growling at them and irritating them. He says in Exodus, he wasn't even let a dog move his tongue against them. Go to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. But dogs were very, you know, dangerous beasts. They were very wild. They could cause a lot of damage. And, I mean, even today... There's still a lot of people, you know, these pit bulls or these big dogs, they can be very dangerous in certain situations. They can, they can harm people, they can kill people. More people die from dogs than a lot of other beasts, than, they, than beasts that you think are dangerous. I mean, everybody agrees a shark is dangerous, but dogs kill way more people than sharks every year, yeah. even in today's world. Go to 1 Samuel 17, look at verse 43. And the Philistine said unto David, Am I a dog? that thou comest to me with staves. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. So we see that when you would come to a dog, you would at least come with a stave. What is that? It's just like a long rod that kind of sharp at the end. So you're just kind of like keeping it at bay. You're trying to keep him back. I mean, maybe you go soul winning. You kind of know, hey, sometimes you got to keep a dog back. you got to kind of keep him away. It'd be nice if you had a stave or something. You're going to get back, dog. You know, you like the chain around his neck. We see... The Philistine was obviously kind of mocking him. He was saying, look, are you coming to me like I'm a dog with just a little stave? Which David didn't even have that. He just had the sling, you know, the rock. But we see that the dog, people would come to them with staves. They would come to them some kind of thing because they were dangerous. They had some level of danger. Go to uh, 2 Kings chapter 8. 2 Kings chapter number 8. Look at verse number 12. And Hazael said, Why weep with my lord? And he answered, Because I know the evil that thou wilt do unto the children of Israel, their strongholds wilt thou set on fire, and their young men wilt thou slay with a sword, and wilt dash their children, and rip up their women with child. And Hazael said, But what is thy servant a dog, that he should do this great thing? And Elisha answered, The Lord has showed me that thou shalt be king over Syria. So he's, saying, he's kind of giving this prophecy to this guy, and this guy doesn't, even, doesn't really know. He's going to end up becoming the king of Syria, and then doing a bunch of really wicked, awful stuff. And the guy even recognizes, he says, wow, am I a dog that I would do such wicked things? Why? Because the dog is a dangerous, wicked animal, according to the Bible. And it, uh, you don't have to turn there, but there's a verse in the Bible for it that said, but Hazael, king of Syria, oppressed Israel all the days of Johas. So he fulfilled that thing. He was oppressing all the people. He was doing all of the, the things that God said were going to come to pass. Go to Psalms 22, if you would. Psalms 22. 
So it's either the dog's unclean, he's unprofitable, he's unwise, he's unsatisfied, and he's unsafe. Psalms chapter 22, look at verse 20. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling, from the power of the dog. Like I said, we probably have a work view. I don't look at the chihuahua as being that powerful. As in that dangerous. But most dogs, especially of the past of, of, of history, were very vicious animals. They're very strong animals. You, you maybe liken them more into like a, what we think of a wolf today. Of something being very strong, very powerful. And I mean, it'll eat flesh, it'll eat blood. Look at Proverbs. Go to Proverbs chapter 26. Proverbs 26. I'll read for you verse 17. He that passeth by and meddleth with stripe belonging not to him is like one that taketh a dog by the ears. He's saying that would be a really dangerous thing to do is just grab a dog by the ears. Because that dog's probably going to rip your flesh open or it's going to bite you or it's going to do something that's going to hurt you. Because dogs can be vicious. Dogs can be dangerous. Go to Jeremiah 15. Last place we'll look for this point. Jeremiah chapter 15. So we're kind of just flipping through the Bible and keep going back and forth and looking at the six attributes that I think the Bible outlines as dogs. I think so far it's been super clear. This beast is not a good thing. When he's saying beware of a dog, it's making it clear. This is not an animal that's good. And that's how we can know. I mean, the Bible, even on something so what seems insignificant or so small, just the fact of a dog, it's so consistent because it's the Word of God. We can trust every single word. We know that when it talks about anything, all the examples of the Bible are going to be perfect illustrations. They're all going to flow together because God's perfect. Man couldn't write that book. Man would have all kinds of errors and, and chops and contradictions. Only God's Word can be such a flawless, perfect book like this. Amen. Go to Jeremiah 15, look at verse 3. And I will appoint over them four kinds, saith the Lord, the sword to slay, and the dogs to tear, and the fowls of heaven and the beasts of the earth to devour and destroy. So we see the dogs are dangerous. I mean, they're going to tear. They're going to destroy. They're going to do wicked things. And we see the unsaved, the ungodly today, they're so full of murder and wickedness. They're full of war and envy and strife. We see that man before the flood, they are full of violence. I mean, the unsaved person just wants to kill and murder and is full of blood. We need to beware of dogs. Let's go to our last point. I think this is going to kind of help us sum it up. Go to Deuteronomy 23. Deuteronomy number 23. So see that the dogs are unclean, they're unprofitable, they're unwise, they're unsatisfied, they're unsafe. And the last attribute that I think the Bible really articulates to the dogs, we're going to look at every verse, is that they're ungodly. They're just completely and utterly ungodly. They're not godly in any way. Look at Deuteronomy 23, verse 17. There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel. Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore, or the price of a dog, into the house of the Lord thy God for any vow. For even both these are abomination on the Lord thy God. Amen. So you say, why in the world would God contrast a sodomite with a dog? Well, I think we've sufficiently seen that the dog is what? Always unclean. He's always unprofitable. He's always unwise. He's always unsatisfied. He's always unsafe. Makes me think of somebody. It makes me think of all the faggots and all the sodomites and all the queers out there that are clearly reprobate according to Romans chapter 1. Right. So why can God always say they're a dog? Because the dog's always wicked. It's always ungodly. It's always unsaved. He, why would he use the illustration of a dog? Because he's pointing to an animal with no positive mentions. Just like the sodomite. No positive mentions. Look, cover to cover, no positive mentions. Right. That's why he's likening him unto a dog. But I don't think necessarily that the dog is representing just sodomites in every passage. It's just saying sodomites are always dogs. Dogs aren't always sodomites. The ungodly, the unsaved, they're not all reprobate. They're not all sodomites. But a sodomite is always a dog. Right, it's yeah. never saved. It's always to be something to be weary of, something to, to stay away from, have nothing to do. It's completely unprofitable. That's why he's using this contrast here. You know, we think of dogs today. I kind of hinted at this already. I read on, on the article it said, most breeds of dogs are at most a few hundred years old having been artificially selected for particular morphologies and behaviors by people for specific functional roles. Through this selective breeding, the dog has developed into hundreds of varied breeds and show more behavioral and morphological variation 
than any other land mammal. So we see today we have all kinds of dogs, right? Greyhound, and the, you know, the, like I said, bulldogs, and chihuahuas, who else? Corgi, terriers, labs, poodles. I mean, I can't even name all of them. There's a lot of dogs out there. And we see it through artificial breeding. Artificial breeding. And I was thinking about this. I think that's a lot like America today. I think that's a lot like the world today, where we're breeding all these freaks and all these queers. We have the LGBTQ. We keep breeding all these new freaks out there today. All these new breeds of dogs out there today, and they're all unprofitable, and they're all wicked. Right. But you know, right. the dog was always a negative beast. It wasn't a positive animal. But we see that people, through artificial breeding, they try to comb it into something that they think is pleasant or something they think is attractive. Oh, it's just the TV show Will and Grace. It's so funny. It's so harmless. No, it's wicked. It's ungodly. Right. There's nothing profitable in it. Yep. You say, what are, we, what are we doing in the world today? We keep artificially selecting and breeding all these freaks and weirdos. I mean, nobody would have thought of a Caitlyn Jenner. Right. Nobody would have thought of the Chihuahua and all these weird looking animals and beasts, but we keep bringing them out. And people have all this pleasure in them and all this joy. And again, I'm not saying that it's wrong to have a physical dog. I'm taking the spiritual application of what our society is like today. We're supposed to be aware of these beasts. We're not supposed to keep breeding them and feeding them and letting them multiply and saying, oh, it's great, it's fine. You know, you can tame a dog, you can dress it, but at the end of the day, still a dog. It's still always going to be vicious inside. It's going to be wicked. It's going to be unprofitable. It's going to be disgusting and filthy. And these sodomites, you know, today we might dress them up and tame them and make them seem real harmless and innocent, but inside they're wicked and evil. We need to be right. aware of them. Right. But you know, today we look at uh, the world today and there's so many people who they just love their dog. Right. They love their poodle. They love their, their bulldog. I like, they mean they love it more than people. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's sick. Yeah, it's disgusting. That's right. I'll say this. I would rather every single dog on this planet die and go extinct if just one ungodly person would get saved. Right. That wasn't going to our Amen. They're that worthless. We need to get unbrainwashed from the world. I'm not saying that dogs are bad, but people today worship their animal. Right. They worship their beast. They have all these graven images and molten images of their dogs everywhere. Right. I mean, they literally worship it. I have a family member that has like 500 molten images of dogs in their house. It's disgusting. <laughs> it's wicked. It's vile. You walk in, it's, it's like, I mean, a Hindu temple might feel less, you know, idolatrous than that. <laughs> You're like, what in the world? But you see, it affects the hearts of men, and they desire the animals. They click on the TV, and what do you see? You see this sad laugh, you know, it's all, this, the, the kennel, we have all these puppies and we're killing them, adopt and rescue a puppy. Well, everybody's dying and going to hell and people care more about a dog on TV. That's so wicked and evil. Right. I mean, dogs are worthless. We see people today are the same way. They like their dog, they like their actor, they like their musician, they like their athlete. This unsaved person that's completely unprofitable, that's their role model. That's the person they look to. That's the person they want to follow and have fellowship with and look at and idolatry. You know, their actor, their musician, their athlete, their blogger. I mean, they love, these people love Glenn Beck. He's an unsaved Mormon. This guy's an unsafe false prophet, but they just love him so much. We're supposed to be aware of dogs. Because right. you know what? It might come looking innocent. It might come saying, oh, it's so cute, and it's been tamed, and it's great, and look how profitable it is. No, we need to believe the Bible. Amen. We need to have faith in the Bible and say, this is something I should get away from. I should be aware of dogs. These ungodly, these unsafe people. I should have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Go to Psalms 22, if you would. We'll look at a few more passages. Psalms 22, verse 16. It says, for, God, for dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. The unwicked, the wicked, ungodly people, the Jews that rejected Christ, they had him slain. Go to Psalms 59. I'll start reading in verse 5. Psalms 59. 
Thou therefore, O Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, wait to visit all the heathen. Be not merciful to any wicked transgressors. Selah. Verse 6. They return to even. They make a noise like a dog and go round about the city. Behold, they belt out with their mouth swords are in their lips. For who say they doth hear? But thou, O Lord, shalt laugh at them. Thou shalt have the heathen in derision. Look at uh, verse uh, 14. Skip down a little bit. It says, And at even... Let them return and let them make a noise like a dog and go around about the city. Go to Matthew chapter 7, if you would. Matthew chapter 7. So we see these dogs. They're wicked. They're making the noise like a dog. The ungodly sounds of this world, all their music, all their filth. I mean, we hear the ungodly saying, and they're, gonna, they're, they're wicked. They're trying to surround you to kill you. And they make their sound. They make their howl. It's kind of like a wolf sound, probably, I, I would imagine, in the Bible. But look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Neither cast ye pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. What was Christ saying? He's saying, look, there's really no point in trying to church the unsaved. In trying to church those that don't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You shouldn't cast your pearls before swine. The only thing you should give to an unsaved person is the gospel. I mean, it doesn't even make any sense that these repent of your sins people. I mean, why in the world would someone who says, I don't believe the Bible, I don't believe Jesus, follow the Ten Commandments? It doesn't make any sense. But these people on the street corners, these street preachers, they're yelling at them to repent of their sins and to turn from their sins. That doesn't make any sense. Get them saved first, then teach them the Bible. There's no point in going around and just telling people how wicked and ungodly they are when they're unsaved. Just try and give them the gospel. Try and preach them Christ and Him crucified, and that's it. That's what Paul did. He wasn't going around telling them how evil and wicked and terrible they were all the time. Obviously from the pulpit, we got to preach what the Bible says. But I'm saying when you go out in the world, there's not really any point to just badger some person about how wicked and evil they are. Try and give them the gospel. Try and get them saved. Because guess what? They might just turn around and rend you. And that's what you see these street preachers are constantly getting punched in the face and their, their sign torn down and thrown in their face. Why? Because it's not, it's not profitable. Go to Matthew 15. Matthew 15. You're going to kind of hurry. I'll read for you. Let's look at verse 26. It says, But he answered and said, It's not me to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. Look, it's not. we shouldn't be taking the Bible and trying to cast the dogs. It's for the, it's for the church. Church is for the saved. It's not for the unsaved. It's for the saved. Look at verse 27. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Yeah, I mean, every once in a while you might get an unsaved person coming in here. They might get a little extra Bible. They might hear a preaching online or something. I mean, it's not that they can't get it, but it's not purposed for them. We see that the crumbs, the, pur the, the purpose of the meal that the mom makes isn't for the crumbs to go to the dog. They're just getting some spilt leftovers. Look at Mark 7. Mark chapter 7, if you will. Mark 7, verse uh, 27, the Bible says, But Jesus said unto her, Let the children first be filled, for it is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it unto the dogs. So kind of the same thing, Mark 7, verse 28, And she answered and said unto him, Yes, Lord, yet the dogs under the table eat of the children's crumbs. So we see the same thing. Go to 2 Peter 2 and go to Revelation 22. It's the last places we'll turn. 2 Peter 2, Revelation. So we've looked at already 38 verses about dogs. Right. Nothing positive. It's kind of a little unique of a sermon. We're just trying to do a Bible study on this word. But if he's going to tell us to beware of dogs, I'd like to know what that means. It's because he doesn't explain dogs and, you know, he doesn't use the word dog in that passage. We've got to use the rest of the Bible. We've got to compare spiritual with spiritual to get a greater understanding of what this word dogs means. 2 Peter 2, look at verse 22. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that is washed to her wallowing in the mire. The, the dog's always unsaved. He's always wicked. He's just going to turn back into his own vomit. Go to Revelation 22. So you see, they're always ungodly. You see that they're, they're always wicked. They're unclean beasts. They're unprofitable. They're unwise. They're unsatisfied. They're unsafe. They're ungodly. The Bible says beware of these people. We shouldn't make close you know, friendships with the unsaved. We shouldn't be looking up to the unsaved as our role models, you know, thinking, oh, they're harmless. We've tamed them. They're not that bad. Look at Revelation 22, verse 14. Blessed are they that do His commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. The dogs are always unsaved. They're always wicked. They're always vicious. And they're, they're not going into heaven 
For without means, without means just outside, meaning they're not going into heaven, they're outside the gates, the dogs, the unsaved people. And our main joy should not be from dogs. It shouldn't be from real dogs. It shouldn't be from the unsaved. We need to do as Paul instructed us and beware of dogs. They may seem harmless and fun, but if we have faith in the Bible, if we believe what the Bible says, we can know our fellowship should be with believers. We should find our greatest friends that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. We should be equally yoked together with believers. Amen. We should find other soul winners, and we should let iron sharpen iron. And we should beware of dogs in every form. Right. The Bible makes it super clear. This isn't a positive mention of dog. There's not one in the Bible. I think I proved that pretty well tonight. Let's close, our, uh, let's close in prayer. Thank you, Father, so much for uh, giving us your Bible. Thank you that uh, we can live by every word of God. And we can take every single you know, piece of it and we can pair spiritual with spiritual and get greater understanding. Thank you for giving us easy illustrations that help us just understand greater spiritual truths. I pray that every single person in this room would have the faith and the understanding and knowledge to be aware of the dogs out there today. That we should be like-minded fellowship with other believers. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.